Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Aaron Swedfeger, Masters of Science candidate at the University of Regina, will be talking about Saskatchewan's migratory birds, sorry, Saskatchewan's migratory bats on the move. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. And November will be a busy month for our native prairie speaker series. On November 29th at noon, Brandon Berta, Masters of Science student at the University of Regina, will be talking about sharp-tailed grouse lex in southwest Saskatchewan. We also have two in-person presentations going on in the communities of Valmarie and Glentworth, and that's on November 26th and 27th, respectively. You can join us on De December 19th at noon for a presentation about the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program by Alexandra Froessi. We have information about any of these presentations on the PCAP website, and that's www.pcap-sk.org, and all of these presentations are free, and everyone is welcome to join. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by TransCanada Corporation, Canada North Environmental Services, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly Sask, Information Services Corporation, Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, Inc., and Wildlife Habitat Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the University of Regina. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about our presenter. Erin did her undergraduate degree in environmental science at the University of Calgary and worked as a research technician on a BAT project during that time. She then spent a few years working in environmental consulting. In 2017, Erin came back to research through an internship in Panama at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Now, Erin is working on her master's with Drs. Erin Bearwald and Mark Bringham at the University of Regina studying bat migration in southern Saskatchewan. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Erin and you can take over. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Well, hello and thank you everyone for tuning in today. I am going to talk to you about there we go. I'm going to talk to you about the three migratory tree roosting bats that we have in Saskatchewan. So first I'll tell you a little bit about these bats and then I'll talk to you about why I'm studying. So these are our three bats. We have the eastern red bat, the hoary bat on the right, and the silver -headed. To start off, the eastern red bat is named very creatively for its fox-like color. Uh, it's pretty small. It weighs about 10 grams and their wings are as, about as long as a standard ruler. And they're long and sort of tapered, which helps them to fly fast as they hunt for insects. Um, they use echolocation to do this. So, that's like them flying around and as they fly around, it's like a high pitched scream at the top of your lungs, but at a really high frequency. So most humans, these bats, all humans can't hear them. Um, and so they put these sounds out into the environment and the echoes come back to their ears and this gives them information about their surroundings and helps them find food. In the summer, they hang from branches during the day and because of their red color in deciduous trees, they kind of look like a dead leaf, which helps them hide. And during the summer, they have babies. And as you can see from the picture on the lower left, their babies sort of hang with them on a branch during the day. And these bats are a little bit unusual. Most bats have around one pup, and these guys can have up to four. 
And in the winter, they migrate first. And then we think that they spend their winters hibernating actually under leaf litter, which is pretty interesting. The red bat ranges from parts of northern Canada all the way down to Mexico. And from some studies that we've done, we kind of know that they spend their summers as far north as Canada, so they arrive about late May, and they start to leave the province of Saskatchewan, for example, around the mid to end of July, and they're pretty much gone by the end of September. And these guys go down to the southeastern parts of the United States to spend their winters. Um, next up, we have the silver-haired bat. Uh, so they're mostly black, but they have these frosty tips or silver hairs on their backs that you can kind of see. And they're about the same size of wingspan as the red bat, but they weigh a little bit more. Um, they also eat insects. In fact, all the bats in Canada eat insects, and they are the primary consumers of nocturnal insects, including things like moths and beetles that can be crop pests. A recent study estimated that bats can save agriculture around $22 billion a year in North America. These particular bats, unlike the red bat, they actually roost inside tree cavities or under peeling bark during the day. And they have usually one, maybe two pups in the spring and summer. And they also migrate to slightly warmer places and they hibernate but either under bark or in rock crevices. And they are a little bit more widespread than the red bat. They go a little further west and a little further north. And they also spend their summers in parts of the boreal forest and aspen parkland. And then in the winter, they go down to, some of them spend their winter in the Pacific Northwest and others go down to the southern parts of the United States. The hoary bat is our biggest bat in Canada. And so they weigh up to 35 grams and they are named also for the frosty tips on their fur, which kind of makes them look like hoarfrost. Um, and again, they also eat insects, but they eat a little bit bigger insects like moths and beetles because uh, they're a little bit of a bigger bat. Like the red bat, they also roost hanging from branches, and you can see the one on the lower left in a spruce tree. They're very well camouflaged, just hanging there. They usually have about two pups that also hang with them during the day. And they go the furthest. They overwinter as far as the southern United States and northern Mexico. So you can see their range is a little bit bigger. And some recent studies have found from museum occurrences that they spend their summers again up in Canada, and then they leave. Usually, they're pretty much gone by the end of September. But why do they leave for the winter? Well, you've been in Saskatchewan right now, for instance. It's pretty cold, and there aren't many bugs for these bats to eat or water for them to drink. So some species of bats actually do stay in Saskatchewan for the winter and hibernate like the little brown bat and the big brown bat and a couple of others. But these bats migrate, which is a two-way seasonal long distance movement. And there's a lot that we still don't know about these bats and their migration. So as I kind of said in each of the species, uh, we kind of know when they arrive and when they leave, so from about mid-May to the end of September, they're sort of around the parts of Saskatchewan. And we have rough ideas from where people have found them, that they spend their summers in the northern parts of Canada and their winters further south. But unlike birds, we don't really know how they get exactly between their summer habitats and their winter. We know that there are some habitat features that are important for bats, so they need access to trees for roosting. Um, 
They need water to drink. That's really important for bats. And they need food to eat so that they can get really fat and survive the winters. And so they don't have these things in Canada in the winter, so they leave. And when they leave, they have to pick a route somehow. And that's the part that we don't really know exactly. We know that they need some guide for navigation and some way to orient themselves. So some previous studies have looked at what they might be using. Echolocation doesn't carry very far. The sound, as you can imagine, if you scream, only goes so far out into the environment. And so they need something to find their way. And some previous studies have found that maybe linear landscape features might serve as visual guides for these bats as they fly. So things like ridge lines or river valleys, something that they can follow as they fly from north to south in the fall and the reverse in the spring. Uh, and as you can imagine, these bats are pretty small and Saskatchewan is a pretty windy place. So things like dominant winds might also help to determine where they fly. And we know for orientation, there's some evidence that some bats can see starlight. Some bats, they've actually found magnetite in their body, so there might be some sort of magnetic component to their orientation. They can see uh, the direction where the sun is setting as they wake up every evening, so they can kind of figure out where to go that way. So there are a few things that might help them find their way. Um, so why do we need to know these things? What's, what's important to know? Why do we need to know them? Well? So bats in general are facing, Caitlin, I'm sorry, I think we can hear your mic. Pardon me? I can hear someone's mic, I think. Okay, I'll just make sure everyone is muted then. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Um, so bats in general are facing various threats to their population. Um, and so things like climate change are affecting bats and the insects that they eat. Habitat loss is affecting them pesticide use, and for some species of bats, things like white nose syndrome is affecting species like the little brown bat and is killing millions of those species. But for these three migratory tree roosting bats, they're lucky they're not affected by white nose syndrome, but they are being killed in large numbers at wind energy facilities in North America. So the exact number of fatalities per year is varies in estimates, but the general consensus is that it's probably around 500,000 bats per year in North America, based on estimates from around 2013 levels of development. And 80% of those fatalities recorded are of these three migratory tree roosting bat species. So the hoary bat, the silver haired bat, and the eastern red bat. A recent study was done that was looking at potential population impacts because there's also a lot that we don't really know about how big their populations are. And this study estimated that for the hoary bat, if current fatality rates continued, we could see up to a 90% decline in the hoary bat population in the next 50 years. So with all that in mind, my main objective for my master's project is to find out where these bats are going as they migrate through southern Saskatchewan in the autumn, because actually most of the fatalities that are recorded happen during autumn migration. And the idea is that if we can figure out where there are fewer bats during their autumn migration, then we can help wind energy planners to locate wind energy facilities where there are fewer bats to be killed. So based on some of these ideas about how bats might navigate and orient themselves when they're migrating, we think that the bats are likely to concentrate in some non-random pattern across the landscape. 
and that there might be greater bat activity associated with resources for migrating individuals, like we see trees, and water, um, and access to food while they're migrating. So I looked at this question in southern Saskatchewan, and uh, whenever anyone would ask, where are your study sites? I would say I have sites from Lake Ethanbaker all the way across to the Quill Lakes, down to Moose Mountain, and across the East End. And so if we kind of look at that study area and we think, well, how might the bats move through that area? There's a few possible things that they could do. So one is if no resources are really important to them, if they don't really care what's on the landscape, they're just going straight south, we might see even bat activity all the way across the southern part of the province during the migration period, which is from about July 15th to September 30th. If they look for things like linear landscape features, we know that there are a few ridge lines in southern Saskatchewan. It's not completely flat. So maybe they might follow something that looks like the arrows shown in red here. And if they mostly are trying to follow resources that are available like trees and water, they might fly sort of around the prairies following trees. So this kind of lines up with a study that was done a few years ago by Dr. Erin Bearwald in Alberta. She looked at uh, bat migration for the hoary bat and the silver-haired bat along the foothills, and she found that there was more bat activity during autumn migration along the foothills than there was to the east in the prairies. So maybe they're doing something similar in Saskatchewan. Maybe they're following the trees in the eastern part of the province. To study all of this, I used something called a bat detector. And this is a little box, basically, that's about the size of a trail camera or maybe a small lunch box. And we put these boxes out on the landscape and they have a microphone attached to them. And this microphone records their echolocation calls as they fly by. Um, and it runs from sunset to sunrise. Yep, that was right. <laughs> and, and, um, and we leave it out for about two weeks at a time, and then we collect the data. And the data that we get shows us the bats that were flying by and the three bats that we're interested in actually call at different frequencies. So we can look at these on a computer and listen to the files that we record, and we can have an idea of who's flying by and when. The sites that I had set up, so Sask Power um, purchased a series of nine of these bat detectors, and we set them up across the study area. And so we had sort of a grid that we overlaid in the study area of three by three. And in each of the grid zones, we had two sampling sites shown in yellow, and we placed our sampling sites in and around these what we called target zones, which are shown in the orange there. And those target zones were areas that had high wind energy potential, um, partly because we were trying to control for wind and partly because we were interested in areas that might be useful for wind energy development as that increases in the problem and also prominent landscape features. So we're looking for things that might serve as these visual cues for bats as they migrate. And if you see, we also divided our grid from west to east, which will become important later. And I've been out in the field now for two seasons collecting this information, recording bats. And so I have some very preliminary results that I'm happy to share with you today. So if we look, on the y-axis here, so the vertical axis, I have it presented as mean bat passes per night. So on average, the number of bats that fly by um, is more or less um, per night. And we say a bat pass is when we record a bat flying by um, and they call a certain number of times, so three times, within a second of each other. And that 
helps us sort of differentiate whether it's um, you know one bat flying back and forth or you know five bats flying by and we looked at this so first of all in this graph we looked at it uh, over the course of the field season from July to September and we can kind of see that activity drops off in the month of September so this helps us to see that the bats are sort of leaving the area around when we expected them to. Uh, then the maybe more interesting result that I was able to pull out. So if you remember, I had that grid design for my sampling sites from west to east. And we can look again at mean number of bat passes per night recorded by these detectors. And we can see that in the eastern part of the province, there's much higher bat activity during our migration, which is really interesting. So if we go back to some of these hypothetical bat movement figures that I showed you earlier, and we think about that maybe bats might be going around the prairies following trees and water, that sort of fits with what I found. And if we frame that in terms of what's happening on the landscape, we can look at the different ecozones that Saskatchewan has. So Saskatchewan has five different ecozones. Um, and all of my study sites happen to fall in that southern third of the province in the prairie ecozone. We kind of drill into that a little bit. We can see that in the bottom left, we have the mixed grassland and sort of that beige color. And looking at a picture from that area, there are really not a lot of trees in that area. It's beautiful, but not a lot of trees. As we get into that middle golden band in the moist mixed grassland, we start to see patches of trees, maybe a little bit more water. And off in the Aspen Parkland, we now see consistently more tree availability and more surface. So if I replot uh, the data that I collected the past couple of years with mean bat passes per night again on the y-axis. And I look at it instead of from west to east, if I look at it from mixed, map, mixed grassland to moist mixed grassland to aspen parkland, we can kind of see that same trend fits. There's higher bat activity during autumn migration in the aspen parkland. So, maybe the bats are choosing to follow something like trees and water as they migrate south uh, because we know that they they actually roost during the day so they need to find a place every single day to roost and they, they eat as they move so they need to find access to water and to insects so maybe they're following the tree line in the Aspen Parkland as they migrate. For my study, the next steps is to sort of look at my data in a little bit more detail and try to see if there are additional patterns in the landscape, if they are using these linear landscape features um, as they move, things like that. And so from what I've found so far, it looks like resources are important for these three migratory tree roosting bats as they move through the province in the fall. And this is actually good news for wind energy development in Saskatchewan, which we know is going to increase in the next few years. And so far, the wind energy facilities that we've seen have been mostly for the west. And if the bats are moving further east, it's actually good news for bats as well. And with that, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Erin. That was really interesting. That was very comprehensive. Uh, we do have a few questions from the audience here. And to all of our audience members, you're welcome to type in any questions um, into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Um, so our first question is from a listener named Linda, and she would like to know what is it about wind farms that messes up their echolocation so 
that they collide with them? Uh, thanks for your question, Linda. So, um, we think that bats are killed in two ways at wind farms, and it's not necessarily because it messes up their echolocation. So, like birds, they can be struck by the wind turbine blades, so they can die from the collision. Uh, but they can actually also be killed the second way, something called barrow trauma, which is due to there's a zone of low pressure that's created around the turbine blades as they spin. And for birds, their lung structure is different, so they're not affected the same way. But for bats, when they fly in, it affects their ears and their lungs um, and causes damage to these structures, and they can be killed that way as well. And for the wind turbine blades, they spin really fast. So bats are either not seeing them or they're sort of flying under them and they're being struck. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have two questions here that are similar. Um, a listener named Dana and a listener named Heliana. Um, they're both interested in learning about how they can encourage bats to roost near a property in order to help them. Um, and then the other one is wanting to know a little bit more about bat houses and if bats actually use those. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we do... Are you still there? But if that's not possible, or if you want to help bats and you don't live somewhere where there are trees, you can put up bat houses. Um, and so bats, like I said, they need access to water. So the very first thing that they do when they wake up during the day in the summer, it's really hot in their roosts and they go out and they find a drink. So it needs to be said about 400 meters to water, but maybe a little further might work too. And they like to be nice and toasty warm during the day. So if you have a bat house, you can put that up on something that is south facing. And you want to put it up away from predators, things like cats, which can kill bats. Um, and so it would be up you know, on the side of a building facing south, or you can get these bat boxes that are designed on poles that can face up away from predators. And you need to put it sort of away from clutter because they kind of, they come in and they almost have like a little landing strip at the bottom. If you've ever seen a bat house, it looks like a birdhouse, but the opening is at the bottom, and then there's a little panel that comes down. So the bats will come in, sort of head up and land on that, and then flip around and scooch into the roost. We want that landing pad to be accessible. Um, and in terms of whether or not bats use bat houses, there's a lot of research being done on that. Sometimes it can take a few years before they decide to move into a bat house. So if you put one up and there aren't bats in it right away, don't get discouraged. Um, and they're also doing a lot of work redesigning bat houses. So they're trying to make them multi-chambered. So instead of just having sort of a box with an opening at the bottom, they'll have different designs inside them. So there might be more than one place that they can go into. So if they get too hot, too cold during the day, they can kind of move around and help to regulate their temperature. Um, and there's also some neat things being done trying to make bat houses more like a natural roost so that bats will choose them. Hmm. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question is, what is the status of bats in Canada, like the population status? Uh, it depends on the species. So right now there are these species of bats in Canada that are listed as endangered. And this is due to what's happening in the East mainly so far uh, with white nose syndrome. So the little brown bat, the northern long-eared bat, and the um, Eastern pipistrelle, 
Sorry, I'm only thinking of the Latin name, Perimiotis simplitis. They are listed as endangered, and they are unfortunately being affected by white nose syndrome, which was actually found in Manitoba this year, but has not been found in Saskatchewan yet. And the three species of migratory tree roosting bats, we have very little information about their population. So that study that I mentioned that estimated a possible decline in hoary bats over the next 50 years of up to 90%. Their best guess was that the hoary bat population might be around two and a half million bats and they're declining. And silver-haired bats and eastern red bats are also declining as far as we know. Thank you. How important is it to learn more about their migration? Um, well, I'm spending a few years of my life looking at it, so I think it's pretty important. Uh, but for these species in particular, it's important because the migration period is when most of those fatalities at wind energy facilities are occurring. So. Uh, during the spring migration, not as many of the bats are being killed, and we don't know exactly why. We think that they might either be following different routes and are not interacting with wind energy facilities as much in the spring, and they might also be flying higher. So hoary bats have actually been struck by planes wow. as they fly so high. Um, so, but in the autumn migration, something is happening that their migration pathways, which as I said, we don't fully understand yet, are overlapping with these wind energy developments in North America. Hmm. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, what are some predators of bats? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we know that cats kill bats if they can get a hold of them. Uh, there are also things like hawks and owls, if they can get a hold of them, will also eat bats. If you've ever watched a video, um, there's of bats coming out of a cave, which these three species that I'm studying don't do. But you can sometimes see that hawks and snakes will hang out outside of the cave entrance at dusk waiting for bats to come out. So in other parts of the world, snakes are also a big predator for bats, but here it's mostly owls and cats, and if crows and magpies would probably also eat them if they can get a hold of them. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what exactly is the white nose syndrome and what will happen if it comes into Saskatchewan? So white nose syndrome is caused by a fungus called Pseudogymnoactis Gymnoascus destructans. And this fungus um, gets on bats like the little brown bat. And when they're hibernating, so they hibernate in things like caves, and they spend most of their winters in a state like bears do, where they lower their metabolic rate and they sort of sleep through the winter and they lower their temperature and they lower their immune defenses and this fungus is like an irritant to them so it gets on their skin and it make, it wakes them up it makes them really itchy it damages their wings and um so they wake up too early and too often during the winter and they deplete their reserves of fat and they either die from starvation or dehydration which is really sad um, and it was found in New York State in around 2006, 2007, and has been spreading from there ever since. And we don't know if it's going to come into Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan is really dry, and this fungus thrives in humid, damp, cave-like environments. And also Saskatchewan doesn't have very many caves. So optimistically, it might not come here. And if it does, then it is going to likely affect uh, the little brown bat and some of the other myotis species further south in the province. Okay. 
Along you know, the same lines of that um, question there, um, a listener named Sherry would like to know, are Saskatchewan's migratory bat species easily affected by this in other locations? And do you think that's the way that it'll come into our province is through the migratory bird, the migratory bats? Uh, that's a good question. So the spores of the fungus that I was talking about have been found on silver-haired bats, but the silver-haired bats haven't been affected by white-nose syndrome, if that makes sense. So they aren't being killed by it. Um, and the spores have not been found, to my knowledge, on hoary bats. And in terms of how it would get into the province, I... I'm not exactly sure if it would be from that or if it would more likely be from the little brown bats or some other bats that carry it moving around. I'm not sure. Interesting. Thank you for that answer. Humans, <laughs> Humans can also move it around from moving between caves. Yeah. Hmm. Sounds like we. there's lots about bats that we don't know. There is a lot. <laughs> They're fascinating creatures and there's a lot left to learn. Yeah. Um, it looks like there's one more question here, which might end up being our last one if there aren't any more. Um, a listener okay. named Toby Dawn would like to know, did you have a favorite memory or experience during your time in the field these last two years? <laughs> ah, that is a great question and a really hard one to answer. <laughs> um, the whole experience. When you study bats, um, a lot of time you get to drive around and you get to see all the beautiful landscape in Southern Saskatchewan. And I got to meet a lot of really wonderful people. Um, because a lot of them let me go onto their land and look for bats. And I got to tell stories about bats to lots of people. And I got to work with some really amazing people. Um, so yeah, it's been a really great experience. Awesome. How much more work do you have until you're finished your master's? I'm hoping to defend next August. So right now I'm going to do more analysis on my data and then write up my thesis. Right on. It actually looks like we've have had a few more questions come in. Um, a listener okay. named Avens would like to know, have there been any studies looking at the relative weights of bats during spring versus winter migration and at different locations to look at whether they are feeding more um, and flying lower during the autumn migration versus the spring? Okay, there's a lot in there. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm right, we're looking at relative weights and and during the spring, yeah, like during yeah, spring, spring versus winter migration and does that impact their um, their flying lower? There have been studies. Um, I am still learning about some of them, so I'll do my best to answer this. So in the spring, they are leaner, and the females also, when they fly up, are already pregnant. So they come up pregnant, so they're heavy because they have babies um, in their bellies, but they are leaner for sure. And we think that they might fly more directly during the spring as well. Um, I think so. And in the fall, some bat species have been recorded following migrations of things like moths. And these moths might fly at different heights during different times of the year. So it might be related to where the insects are in terms of where they feed. And we do have evidence that these bats are feeding during migration. Um, so they, they are eating as they go. Um, and we do know that they pack on weight in the fall before they leave. So they get, some of them especially get pretty beefy <laughs> as the fall starts to go on. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and a listener named Robin would like to know, um, mm -hmm. known if pesticides, um, like how do pesticides impact bats? Is it directly through bioaccumulation or is it indirectly through changes to insect populations? 
That is also a great question that I know a little bit about. So I will try to answer again. I think from what I understand, um, a lot of the effects are from um, impacts to insect populations. So availability of food for the bats. Uh, I don't know about toxicity to them, but I believe there are studies that have looked at that. Um, and I can't speak directly to whether or not they've found pesticides accumulating in bats, but I do know that their, their food source is being greatly affected. And I mentioned also climate change is affecting bats, and that also has to do with when and where their food is available, which is changing as well. Thank you. Um, a listener named Tracy would like to know if um, antifungals are effective um, against the white nose syndrome, at least in the lab. And has there been any work done to look at possible cures for this white nose syndrome? There is a lot of work being done to look at ways to stop the spread, to cure the bats, to cure their habitats. Um, but it's very complicated because they are in these sensitive cave ecosystems. So there's some really cool work that's been done with UV light, actually. They found that um, UV light kills the fungus. And so they're looking at ways that that can be applied to either treat bats or maybe treat the caves. There's some really exciting work being done. Um, and some of that is being done by the Willis Lab in Manitoba. And a former student of the U of R, Alyssa Stolberg, who also helped me out last summer, is working on some of that. There's a lot of work being done. There's a huge effort by the bat research community to try and help these bats out and figure out what's happening to them. For sure. That's really good to know. We um, often don't have a lot of bat presentations, so it's pretty exciting that you're able to come talk to us today. And I've learned from your presentation that there's, there's a lot that we don't know about bats, and we have a huge need for more research but i'm glad to hear that there's work going on about the white nose syndrome and, and how to cure bats and, and their habitat it looks yeah. like um that's it for the questions that we have um so with that i i guess i just want to thank everyone for um tuning in today and watching our presentation um i just wanted to let everyone know that when you leave the webinar there will actually be a um a uh, quick one minute survey that'll pop up. So if you don't mind taking a minute to fill that out, that'll be great and that'll help us with getting funding um, for our webinar series into the future. Um, and Erin, I really wanna thank you for taking the time to do this presentation. Um, we really, really appreciate that you're able to, to make it work and, um, and share all of your information and your wisdom with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to wish everyone a great day. And yeah, enjoy the sun and this warm fall day. So thank you, everyone. Bye.